Christian Theological Society. I'm happy to see everybody here tonight at the Pinksburg Library. Um, we are going to be talking about family Bibles, which is setting us up incredibly well for our family Bible scanning day, which is going to be on the 29th of April. We'll have um, materials here, uh, a set up um, devices to scan your family Bible and do it in a safe way. And so if you have a family Bible and you'd like to bring it in, uh, just please go to the Carroll County Geological Society website and you can sign up there. You can find the link and sign up for a time slot so that you're, you're all set. So that's going to be happening both in the morning and the afternoon. So hopefully you'll find a time that's convenient for you. We have one more meeting of uh, the society of, uh, in the, on the 3rd of May, third Monday of May, so the 15th of May. We are going to have another meeting here again at Kingsburg, and then we have our annual dinner meeting um, in June, and then we'll be taking a break over the summer. Uh, we decided tonight um, at our board meeting that we are going to do some strategic planning on the 22nd of July. That is going to be uh, primarily for board members. If anybody in the general membership would like to join that meeting, please let me know or let Heather know. Um, also, we will be next month in May, we will be voting on our secretary and treasurer, and then they will be installed in our June meeting. So we are going back to our regularly scheduled um, rhythm of uh, officers installation. So secretary and treasurer are installed, voted on and installed in odd years. President and vice president will be uh, voted on and installed in even years. So we went a little bit off during the COVID years. A lot of people pivoted, so we, we had to adjust, um, but now we're back in line with our bylaws. Um, so with that, um, I would like to turn it back over to Heather to introduce um, our guests for this evening, who I'm really excited to have them join us. All right. Hello again. Um, as I said earlier, I am Heather Owings. I am both the branch manager here at the Finksburg branch and also the vice president of the Carroll County Genealogical Society. And it is my great pleasure to um, introduce Gwendolyn Coddington, who is the archivist and special collections librarian at the McDaniel College. Um, she graduated in 2019 from the University of Maryland, College Park with a Master's of Library and Information Science and a Master of the Arts in History. Prior to her position at McDaniel College, she completed an internship at the National Archives and Records Administration, College Park, as their first ever intern in the Motion Pictures Division. Um, Gwen has also served as a co-lecturer for a course on preservation in libraries and archives at the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies. With that, I would just like to welcome Gwen to the Kingsburg Library. Okay, so thank you so much to the Carroll County Genealogical Society for inviting me to speak this evening, and thank you to the Public Library for hosting this event. So I don't want to set expectations too high for tonight, but I did take a public speaking class when I was an undergrad, um, and one of the first things that my instructor taught us was you should always have a good hook, right, to get your audience interested and engaged in what you're speaking about. So when I was thinking about what would make a good hook for tonight's talk, I realized that nothing can be better than when speaking to a bunch of history buffs than to have a little bit of show and tell. So that's what I'm going to do this evening. I've brought along a couple of Bibles from the college archives to get us curious about thinking about these types of texts and what we might learn from them. Oh no, we have just closed out of my PowerPoint instead of going forward. That's not helpful at all. Come on, PowerPoint, you can do it, there it is. All right, moving forward. Okay, so the first example that I have is the Biblia Sacra Veteris et Novi Testamenti. And if your Latin is a little rusty, um, that roughly translates to the Holy Bible of the Old and New Testaments. It's this big old volume right over here, and I encourage you all, some of you have come up already, but if you haven't, please come up afterwards and take a peek at these books. Uh, this particular volume is one of the oldest books that we have in the college archives. It was published in 1602 in Wittenberg, Germany by a German printer named Samuel Selfish. And I can't decide if that's a great name for a person or a terrible name for a person. <laughs> um, it is the Secundum Editionum, uh, which is the second edition of this particular setting of the Bible. Uh, the first one was published in the late 16th century. 
And it is just chock full of these amazing engravings. You can see some of the examples here on the title page. And it also has these incredible full out maps throughout the Bible as well. But just as interesting as the content of the Bible is the marginalia that we can find throughout this book. And it gives us a lot of evidence as to how this book has been used throughout its history. So, for example, it has a book plate on the front board of, of the text, and there's a little book plate from the Western Maryland College Library, complete with a Dewey Decimal classification, and this little north note that says Ward there. So that tells me that this particular book was part of the J.T. Ward collection. And if you know anything about college history, uh, that name will be familiar to you. He was our first college president, but you might not know that he actually gave the college its first library. He was a voracious a private collector. He had somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 volumes in his own personal collection. Um, and after he passed away, he left a lot of those volumes to the college, and we have many of them in our holdings today. We also see other evidence of previous owners throughout this book. There's another book plate that's kind of hiding behind this Western Maryland College one, and it's really faint right here, but there's a tiny notation that says 475. And I'm very curious about that. Was that how much this book sold for at some point? Was it just some errant um, note that somebody needed to write down and this was the first thing that they could grab? <laughs> Who knows? Um, and then also very interesting about this book is that it actually has a due date card on the back. Uh -huh. Yes, this, card circulated, or this book circulated in the college collections well into the 1960s, uh, 360 years after it had been originally printed. So the thing that I'm getting at with this example is that this book has had a very long life just beyond the time that it was created. Another example that we have from our collection, which is this giant book over here, it probably weighs like 10, 15 pounds. Um, it's a German language Bible. We actually have a few of these in the college archives and I'm not entirely sure why. It'd be a really interesting research question to dive into sometime. This particular book was published in 1755 and it came to the college 250 years later in 2005 from a private donor. Uh, as you can see from the title page here, it has that beautiful Gothic script that you oftentimes see in German language books. Uh, in my German, not very good, but there's a few things that we can pull out uh, from the text here. Uh, we can see the name Martin Luther up the top here, which likely means that this book was based on his translation of the Bible. Um, and we also know that the book was printed in Nuremberg. And something really curious about this printing of the Bible, which another research question that I have, it includes a lot of short histories of early modern Germany at the front, which is very curious to me. Um, so this picture all the way at the end here is an etching of, I'm going to butcher this name, Johann Ernst of Saxe Eisenach, and he was a duke in the uh, 16th century. So why is he included in this German language Bible? I do not know, but I'm very curious to know more about that. Um, similar to our Latin Bible, we also have some interesting marginalia throughout this book. So this is an inscription that is on the front board up here, and it reads, This Bible is presented by Father and Mother Becker to her daughter Annie. Annie, this is a valuable gift. God bless you in the use of it. It is riches even in poverty. Its promises are comforting your pastor. So you might notice something kind of interesting about this note. Uh, it's in English, and this is a German language Bible. So that already raises some really interesting questions, right? Were these German immigrants who had learned how to read English? Um, perhaps the owners didn't read German at all, and they just relied on all these beautiful etchings that are throughout the Bible to kind of interact with the text. So the point of these examples um, is just to get you thinking about the little clues that allow us to ask more questions about our Bibles as objects of history and not just texts. So hopefully the examples that I gave you will kind of get you thinking about your own Bibles um, and help you ask a few more questions about them. Uh, come on, don't be silly. There we go. All right. So I'm going to spend uh, most of our time tonight talking about preservation techniques for family Bibles. The examples that we just looked at have been around for approximately 421 years and 268 years, respectively. Uh, books are hardy, but they're not impervious to time and decay. They require attention and resources to be preserved. Um, so I'm going to go over just some specific techniques, things that you can do at home to help you work on your own preservation. And then I'm going to end with going over some ways that family Bibles can be used in genealogical research. So to start with, I just want to start with like our big picture here and some frameworks to get us thinking about preservation before we get into some of the specific details and to-dos. 
So one of the first concepts that I want to introduce to you is this idea of preventative preservation or preventative conservation. You can find both um, words kind of used interchangeably in the literature. And what I mean by preventative preservation, it's, it's really just actions that you can take to prevent the deterioration of your materials. So the goal is to stop deterioration before it happens, um, or if it's already happening, to sort of arrest it before it continues to happen. And a lot of my recommendations are going to be kind of based on that idea. We're also going to be using this idea of agents of deterioration, which is just a, a term that cultural heritage institutions has come up with to describe the external forces which accelerate preservation risks in archival materials. Um, there's something like 10 or 11 that they've come up with. We're going to focus on seven of them tonight. And then lastly, we're going to take a scaffolded approach to creating a preservation plan. And I came across this idea in a previous webinar that I've done, and I really like it. It's this idea of getting started with addressing a risk and then getting better at it. I have found that it can be really overwhelming doing preservation. There are so many different things you have to pay attention to, so many different risk areas that it can feel like if you're not hitting all of those marks, like why bother, right? But I will really encourage you all to think that doing some preservation is still doing preservation, right? You are still taking the actions necessary and it'll make a difference in the long run. Um, as part of that, I also want to emphasize that you guys are the experts in your material, right? You know your family Bibles, you know what conditions they're in, you know what your storage environments are. So you are best situated to make the decisions of what needs to be done to actually care for your materials. Um, so I'm here to provide you the framework to get you thinking, um, and you all are, will make the final judgment there. Okay. With that, we move ahead here. All right, so before we jump in, into actually talking about the external risks to books, I want to mention a few inherent risks that many books possess just due to the nature of their construction. And a lot of these, book, or these risks are often found in mid to late 19th century books created during the introduction of industrialized printing methods. And the first one that I want to talk about is this switch from rag-based paper to wood pulp-based paper. I've been struggling in saying that all week, it's a mouthful. Um, so the thing to know about wood pulp based paper is that it's a lot more unstable and prone to rapid degradation through its very high acidic content. Um, so if you've ever seen paper from this era, it's going to look a little bit like this. It's extremely yellow. It's very brittle. Um, that is just the way that the paper has been constructed. It's like highly acidic. It's going to break down over time um, and it will end up somewhere in this state. So that's one thing to be aware of. The other one is the introduction of what's known as hollow spine binding. So in hollow spine binding, what that means is that the covering of the book, let me pull up an example here. The covering of the book is not actually adhered to the text block itself. So if you kind of squeeze the end of this here, you see a little gap. Um, that's where that hollow spine binding is. And the risk with that is when we go to pull books off the shelves, we like to pull it by the top like this, right? And if you do that over time, you keep putting stress on that end cap, stress on that covering there, and it'll split it over time. So again, just another inherent weakness in the way that these books are constructed, things to be aware of, and we're going to talk about some ways that you can mitigate those risks tonight. All right, so we're going to get started talking about our first agent of deterioration. No, Matt Damon really doesn't have anything to do with agents of deterioration. Um, but I thought, since we're talking about agents so much, I should recruit some very special agents for my presentation, hopefully as a memory aid so you guys will remember, oh, Matt Damon, dissociation, we're going to link those things. All right, so the first agent of deterioration we're going to talk about is dissociation. And when we're talking about dissociation, it just means that we've lost it, right? The item is gone. We don't know where it is. Uh, the risk here is very obvious. The lost item cannot be preserved, right? We cannot take any actions to do anything to uh, keep it along for the run, long run if it is gone. So one of the very easy things that you can get that you can do to get started addressing this particular risk is just to be consistent about where you're storing materials, right? If you keep your family Bible on a particular bookshelf in a particular room, just continue to do that and know that that is where that material is stored. If you want to take it up a, up a notch, um, one thing you might consider is just uh, creating an inventory about what you have that you consider historically or emotionally valuable and writing down where it is, right? Because then we're not re relying on just your memory alone to know where you have all your different items, but you'll have that external reference to go to to track all of your items. 
Related to that, be selective about when and how you are lending things out. It's really helpful to have clear expectations from both parties, and this goes for any cultural heritage institutions as well. If you want to lend to an archives or a, or a historical society, um, consider getting a lending agreement beforehand so you know when your materials are going out, when they're coming back in. Ask questions about where are they going to be stored? Are they going on display? What are those display conditions going to be like? Um, are people going to have access to the materials under what conditions? Make sure that is all clear from the get-go and you know what is going on with your materials. Okay, our next agent of deterioration is light. And the risk with light is that it can increase bleaching, discoloration, and yellowing of paper. So very simply, um, to get started minimizing this risk, you can minimize your book's exposure to light, right? So you turn off lights in room when, they're, when you're no longer in use. Um, storing books out of direct sunlight, it might be really nice to have it in that big bay window that you have at home, but it's not good for the books in the long run. Um, to get a little better in, the, in addressing this particular risk, you might consider changing the lighting conditions of your storage space. So investing in things like room darkening curtains or shades can be a really good way to control that external light, kind of like the great ones that we have in this room here. Um, and similarly, you can measure your light risk or light damage risk, and there's a really cost-effective, easy way to do this. Colored construction paper, right? If you have kids or you remember being young and working with any of that material, you'll know it fades really quickly when exposed to sunlight. So you can measure what your light risk might be in a particular room just by setting out a piece of colored construction paper and then seeing how it fades over time, right? Check it after a week, two weeks, a month. Has it really faded? Have we sucked out all the color? That'll tell you, hey, the lighting conditions in this room, maybe not great for my family Bible. I can consider putting it somewhere else. All right, our next agent of deterioration, and if you've worked at all in preservation, this will be one that's very familiar to you, uh, incorrect temperature and relative humidity. So the risk with this is that hot and humid conditions can increase mold growth and increase that acid degradation in paper, that really nasty yellowing that we saw. On the flip side, if it's too dry and it's too hot, those conditions, if you have anything with weather color colorings, um, it'll dry them out, it'll make them be brittle, and it'll leave them to cracking. So what to do to get started with addressing this particular risk? Um, make sure you're storing your books in cool, dry areas. Um, definitely want to avoid basements and attics. That's kind of can be the go-to place when we're putting stuff that we don't use all the time. Um, we have a tendency to stick it in those areas. Uh, but they tend to be damp or overly hot and cold, and they experience a lot of significant fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity throughout the year especially in Maryland, where we get really hot and humid in the summer, and then we get cold and dry in the wintertime. So basements, attics, right up. Um, you also want to avoid placing your books near any radiators or other heat sources, because this can also overly dry out those materials, especially if you have anything that has leather with it. And then finally, avoid as much as you can placing bookshelves next to exterior walls in your home. Um, this can put them next to pockets of cool, damp air, which can kind of uh, build along those walls, and that dampness is especially risk for any mold growth that might happen. So to take it up a step, if we want to address this particular risk, you might consider introducing better environmental controls into your storage area. So the ideal conditions for book storage is about 70 degrees uh, with 50% relative humidity. humidity. Um, so you can purchase a relatively cheap electronic uh, monitor to kind of track what your temperature and RH is in a particular area. Um, and that'll let you know if you're experiencing a lot of fluctuations over time, if your room's getting too hot, if it's getting too humid, and then you can adjust your uh, condition, environmental conditions um, accordingly, introducing things like air conditioners, humidifiers, dehumidifiers, whatever the need might be that way. All right. Our next agent of deterioration, pollutants. And when we're thinking about pollutants, I'm really talking about gases, dirt, and dust. And the risk here is that excessive dust and dirt can really stain paper and increase the risk of mold and pests. Um, and exposure to other gaseous pollutants can increase a lot of degradation in books. So how to get started addressing this particular risk? Um, one thing to do is just have good air circulation in your storage area. Um, make sure you're not blocking any vents in the room that you keep your books. And if the air feels like it's kind of stale, maybe introduce a fan in that area just to keep it moving a little bit. 
Um, I also suggest avoiding using any storage material that might off gas. And so the one that I most commonly see in the archives is when people will wrap their materials in plastic bags, like Ziploc bags. Uh, that stuff, as it breaks down over time, it'll emit gases that are actually harmful to your archival materials and create damage uh, later on. So just make sure that you're not using anything like that that hasn't been tested and isn't like archival grade uh, to store your materials long term. All right. Our next agent of deterioration, those pesky pests. Um, pests are drawn to books as sources of food and nesting materials. And if you've ever dealt with bed bugs or with termites, you know that an infestation is really hard to treat. And if you do get pests involved in any of your things, it can leave them very chewed up and gross, just like this wonderful pamphlet that I have from the College Archives. You can see at the bottom here where something has just chewed nice little holes in the bottom of it. Um, so when dealing with pests, really my best advice to you all is a good ounce of prevention, right? One of the easiest ways to address this risk is just make sure that you're keeping your storage areas clean, right? Wiping down shelves, remove any excess dirt and dust, vacuuming the area regularly. Um, also make sure that you're limiting food, like potential food supplies for any pests. Um, keep books away from things like plants, which can be really attractive to bugs and other things. Um, and store your books up off the of floors so critters can't get at them quite as easily. All right. <laughs> Physical forces, our next agent of deterioration here. Thank you, Tom Cruise. Um, so when we're talking about physical forces, I'm really focusing in on how you handle and store books. And the risk here is that improper storage and handling can accelerate damage to books through things such as damaged spines, bindings, and stained or torn leaves. So the easiest way to get started addressing this particular risk, uh, when we're thinking about handling in particular, is just to minimize handling your materials as much as possible, right? Every time you pull a book out, there's something that can go wrong with it. You can drop it, you can spill something on it, there's always that risk. However, I am personally also an advocate and a true believer that archival materials and family treasures, we preserve them to enjoy them, right? So we don't want to keep things locked away for forever that totally defeats the purpose. Um, so one of the things that we can do to mitigate this risk is implement proper handling procedures, especially for our books. Um, so the first one I'm going to demonstrate for you is how you can properly remove a book from a shelf. And this goes back to how we were talking about those hollow spine bindings that we find in a lot of our hardback books. Um, and when we're pulling from the edge of the end cap here, we put stress on that binding and we're going to uh, over time lead to split bindings, kind of like I have in my lovely copy of Harry Potter here, um, where it's totally destroyed. So there are two ways that you can properly and safely remove a book from a shelf. The first is by, and I'm doing this backwards, so I apologize, grabbing it from the end of the text block here and just pulling it out like that, right? Again, not putting any stress on the spine. But if you're kind of short like me and you're trying to get to the, a book on the very top shelf, you can't always get back behind the book and pull it out that way. It's a challenge. So the other way that you can do it is scooting back the adjacent books and then grabbing it by the cover this way and pulling it out by the cover. Again, so we're not putting any stress on the top of that spine there. The other common thing that I see a lot when it comes to how you handle books is um, making sure that you're not putting more stress on the binding structure than it can take. Again, if we think back to my example of Harry Potter here, it's been well read many times. I opened it so much that I did in fact just split the book in two. So if you've worked with books before, you know that there's kind of a natural give to how far the book wants to open. And especially if we're doing research in books, the temptation can be to kind of put your elbow down and like write with your other hands. But when we do that, we put too much stress on the joints and uh, we can risk breaking some of the binding that way. So we want to make sure that we're paying attention to the book when it tells us how far it actually wants to open. Similar to that, you can use um, like a book cradle to give the joints a little bit of extra support. A really easy thing you can, you can do with just things around your house is roll up some soft towels and put them on underneath uh, the covers of the book to add a little extra support that way. A couple other tips uh, for how you handle books. We want to make sure that we're avoiding using any pens, sticky notes, highlighters, paper clips, things like that when we're working with our archival materials. If you've ever seen a staple or a paper clip that's been on a piece of paper for a really long time, you know, I feel like Diane is cringing back there, and you know what it looks like, right? It's a really nasty red stain, and it's terrible to deal with. 
Um, similarly, make sure you're not eating or drinking when you're working with your family Bibles. There's always the risk that you can get crumbs in the gutter of the book, which is really hard to get out. It would also attract those pests um, or, of course, spilling liquids on your materials as well. And then finally, when we handle books, we always have clean hands that are free of lotions and hand sanitizers. Uh, and this might be a good time to address what I like to call the myth of the white gloves. Uh, if you ever see any kind of depiction of arch archivists or museum prof professionals in pop culture, I'm thinking like National Treasure, they always have gloves on for everything, these big, thick cotton gloves. Uh, for the most part, when you are working with paper-based manuscripts, and that includes books, you really don't need gloves. Um, there can actually be some risk when you're wearing gloves because you lose your tactile response, right? And you're a lot more likely to tear a page accidentally because you can't feel the page. Uh, the exceptions to that would be if there's um, any damage to the book and you want to protect your hands, obviously, especially if it's, if it's really dirty or if there's red rot pres present, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, of course, that would be a good time. Another time you always want to wear gloves is when you're dealing with photographs because the oils from your fingers will damage the emulsion of the print and will lead smudging and whatnot. So if you're ever dealing with old family photographs, make sure you have some gloves that way. Nitro gloves you can get at CVS, those will work great. All right. <laughs> Going old school for that one. Um, <laughs> I wanna talk a little bit also about shelving in boxes. So to get started with addressing this particular risk, we just wanna make sure that we're properly storing our books on shelves. Um, so books should be stored vertically, squarely upright, and we wanna make sure that they're firmly supported by either neighboring books or book or bookends. Wanna make sure that they're not leaning from side to side or packed too tightly on a shelf so we can't get them off safely. Um, if you have any oversized books, like this big old boy here um, in folio prints, they can be stored horizontally, but you wanna make sure you're not stacking them more than two or three volumes high. If you have damaged, rare, any sort of val uh, valuable items, you might consider some, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth here, Diane, <laughs> making it interesting for you, or Heather. Um, you might consider alternative storage methods, uh, such as book ties, adjustable book covers, or purchasing a book box. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do a book tie. And book ties are really helpful if you have any materials that are split like this, the binding's kind of broken in half, or they're losing pages. Um, it's kind of like wrapping a bow on a Christmas present. So I've got my, this is uh, unbleached cotton tying tape. I bought it from Gaylord Archival Suppliers. It costs about $15 for 100 yards. And the first thing you want to do is just measure out the amount of tape that you need. Obviously, this one is pre-cut, but you'll roughly go horizontally across the book twice and then vertically across the book twice. You get like a rough amount that you need. And then again, doing this backwards is fun. Um, you're going to wrap it just like a Christmas present. Of course, now that I'm trying to do this upside down, I can't think of how I wrap a Christmas present. I'm doing it backwards. Isn't that always the case when you try to demonstrate something for a crowd? It's like, oh, my brain, I don't remember how to do this now, even though I do it every day. <laughs> there we go. OK, so we've got the tie like that. We're going to flip it around. And when you're tying the knot, you want to make sure that it's at the top of the book or at the side of the book. We don't want it on the covers, because that's going to create a weird bulge when we're putting the book back up on the shelf. Of course do not actually want to tie it, but you get the point. Okay, so book ties. The other thing that you might consider a relatively easy storage solution to do at home is to make an adjustable book cover. Okay, so this is what an adjustable book cover looks like. Um, it's made of two sheets of acid-free paper that are measured to the uh, vertical and horizontal dimensions of the book. And they kind of nest inside of each other like this. And then you put the book actually inside. Um, and it's really useful if, again, you have any materials that have that broken board or um, loose pages coming out. It will keep all of those materials together. It also protects really well from dirt, dust, light, any of those other um, agents that we talked about so far. Um, and then we have these Velcro um, tabs here that will adhere those two uh, sleeves together so that you can open and close the book over and over again. 
if you're doing this, I'm not demonstrating one tonight because it takes me like a half an hour to make one. It's a little bit too long. Um, but if you do make one, I highly recommend writing the title of the book on the side here so you know what volume it is on the shelf. And also practicing doing this with poster board beforehand before you actually pull out the archival sheets to do so. Um, these particular ar archival sheets, you can usually get them in packs of five. And depending on the dimensions that you need for your book, they can run anywhere from $15 to $30. So for me personally, I find I like to make sure I know what I'm doing with like non-archival material before I go to the expensive stuff. And then finally, we have our book boxes here. Uh, these are pre-manufactured. Uh, they fit a little bit tighter than the adjustable covers, but they similarly protect a lot from dust, dirt, light, pests, things like that. The price really depends on the size of the book that you need. The last time I checked, they ran anywhere from like $20 to $25 per box, so they are pretty expensive. But if you're only buying one or two of them, they, they might be manageable that way. Um, so the last thing that I want to say when it comes to any sort of materials you might have that's damaged that way is just never, ever try to repair anything with tape. I'm sure you all know that. Um, but if you've ever seen scotch tape that's been on material for 50, 75 years, it's terrible. It's awful to deal with. It might be like a short-term solution to your problem, but in the long run, it will give you more headaches. Trust me. All right, last but not least, um, our last agent of deterioration, catastrophic events. And when we're thinking about catastrophic events, this is earthquakes, floods, fires, all those terrible things that can go wrong. And the risk here, it can be minor damage to your materials to total destruction. So what to do to address this particular risk? Well, my first bit of advice is just know what your risk might be. Um, do you live in an area that's prone to a lot of flooding or earthquakes or wildfires? Uh, you know, in Maryland, we get the occasional tornado and there's usually some flood risks as well, depending on where you're located in the state. And then once you know what your risk is, you know, you can plan accordingly. Um, you can think about what you can do to minimize the impact of one of those events should they occur. So for example, if you live somewhere that you get a lot of earthquakes, you might adjust your storage conditions, um, you know, make sure you're using that wall mounting for your shelves that way, anchoring them properly to the well, to the wall, storing your materials a little bit lower on the shelf, things like that. So doing that pre-planning is really helpful. Um, and FEMA has a really good resource that way. The they have these Save Your Family Treasure guides that talk about what to do if you experience a flood or a fire and how you can work with your materials afterhand or afterwards. And I do have a link to that later in my presentation. Um, the last bit of advice I have on that is just always remember that human lives are more important than your things. Um, never undertake any action unless the environment is safe for you to do so. All right, so a little bit more on preservation here. I wanted to talk about a couple other common conditions that you might see in books, what they look like, what they are. So if they show up in your own materials, you know what it is you're dealing with. So the first one I want to talk about um, is in this picture up here. Uh, this is an example of what's known as foxing. So foxing will appear as red, yellow, and brown spots in paper. Uh, it's oftentimes caused by impurities that have been introduced to, into the paper during the paper making process. So things like metal, dirt, and iron that sort of get in there, um, along with exposure to mold. Foxing will oftentimes activate under high humidity and damp conditions. So this is really good to pay attention to like what your storage environment is like. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not very easily treatable. This would be an instance where you would want to consult a conservator. They would probably have to do some specialized bleaching on the paper, um, and that's something you need a lot of training to do. <coughs> Another condition that you'll oftentimes see, uh, the example down here, is what's known as red rot, which I mentioned earlier. And that's oftentimes found in materials with leather cover coverings, and it's when those leather coverings start to break down, and there oftentimes appears like a dust or a very fine powder. If you've ever picked up a book that has this, your hands will just be covered in that nasty red um, dust later. The cause? Not entirely known. A lot of scholars attribute it to the presence of really strong acids in that leather that's breaking down over time. The treatment, unfortunately, there's not very much that you can do um, if this starts to show up in your books. If you have a book that has this condition, you want to separate it from the presence of other materials right away, especially if they're highly acidic materials, because that will accelerate the breakdown of that leather. And similarly, you don't want that dust getting on all over your other stuff. So this would be a really good candidate for some of those adjustable covers and book boxes that we talked about earlier. And then finally, the last condition I want to mention here is what's known as 
effervescence, which is another word I've struggled with saying all week. I keep wanting to say evanescence, and that's like not the same thing at all. Um, it's also known as fatty spew or leather bloom. We're just like keeping it with the really great names tonight. Um, it oftentimes is confused for mold. It like kind of looks like mold a little bit, but it has a crystalline structure and it feels a little bit like wax, which is kind of curious. Um, it'll oftentimes appear on leather or other heavily starched book cloth, and it appears in humid conditions uh, when a lot of the salts and fats that are in those materials come to the surface and they create this white crystalline product. Um, so the good news is, is that this material, it's non-toxic, it's pretty harmless to the materials itself, and it can be really easily removed with just a soft cloth, just wiping that off the cover there. All right, last bit of preservation that I would like to go over with you guys, that's what to do when you have notes and ephemera in your family Bibles. So family Bibles will oftentimes contain things like newspaper clippings, notes, photographs, I've even seen some pressed plants in some before, um, and it's best practice if you find any of these materials in your Bible um, is to remove them and place them in either acid-free paper or there's mylar enclosures. This is going to prevent any degradation to the pages um, from contact with those other materials, especially if it's newspaper clippings. If we remember our example of the newspaper earlier, highly acidic material, um, and it can leave what's known as uh, acid transfer on the other pages of the Bible. That's where you get like that weird blocky stain that's like in the outline of the clipping. Um, so if you are removing these materials from the, your Bible, you want to make sure that you label what they are. Um, and if you take them out of the Bible entirely, I also recommend writing down what page number they were on. That way you can preserve the context of the original material. If you have anything in your Bible that is adhered to a page, or if there's handwriting in there at all, I highly recommend interleaving a sheet of acid-free tissue paper in between the item with the material on it and the next page. Um, for handwritten notes, this will prevent any smudging from happening, um, and it'll also present, or prevent any of that acid transfer if you got the newspaper clippings and other things like that. All right, so we're going to pivot now to talking a little bit about what you can learn from family Bibles is genealogical records. And in just kind of looking through some of the family Bibles that we have in our collections, uh, these are some of those common bits of information that I can find. You'll find thing, information about births, deaths, marriages, baptisms, uh, christenings, and from those sorts of things, you can extrapolate more information in like church associations, geographic locations. These are all little bits that you can use to launch additional research while digging into your family tree. So I actually have an example up here, it's a little faint, so I'm sorry about that, um, of some genealogical information I found in one of our Bibles. This is the JT Ward Bible, not that cool 16 Bible that I showed you all earlier. This was his family Bible, which I brought along here has that nasty tape on it. I don't know who did that. Um, but he recorded a lot of genealogical information about his family. And one of the things that I had known previously about JT Ward um, was that he and his daughter, his wife, Catherine, had a daughter named Minnie Ward. Um, and Minnie Ward was a student at Western Maryland College. And she married another student at Western Maryland College, T.H. Lewis, who was our second college president. And then their son, A.N. Ward, was our third college president. <laughs> so uh, the nepotism was really strong in the early years of the college history. But anyways, what I didn't realize about J.T. Ward was that he actually had two daughters. Um, and his oldest daughter, Clara Virginia, actually died in childhood. And he wrote a little note about it um, in his family Bible, which I will read. It said, died in the sweet comfort of a Christian child's faith on Friday evening, April 28, 1854, at seven and a half o'clock, Clara Virginia, oldest daughter of J.T. Ward and C.A. Ward, aged four years, nine months, 20 days, and nine and a half hours. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So there's some interesting hard details that we can pull out from this entry. entry. We, we get the death date. We can extrapolate the birth date as well if that's not recorded. And then we also have information about the genealogy, who the parents were. But there's also some soft details that come through, right? We get a lot of personality of the author. Um, and I know this from having had a lot of JT board uh, materials in my archives, but um, he calculates down almost to the minute, like how old his child was when she died. And to me, this really reflects his own fastidious nature that you can see in a lot of his other archival materials, but then also just how much he really did love his family. Um, so you can get really interesting personality notes from these kinds of entries as well. All right, so I want to pivot now to thinking about 
how to approach family Bible records as historical artifacts. Um, so like all historical artifacts, it's best to trust but verify the information that you are given. Uh, recognize that even though the information was written down, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate. Um, so I crit some of these questions from the, I think, Montgomery Historical Society. They have a really great family Bible website. Again, included the link in my presentation. Um, but these are just some questions you can ask yourself as you're starting to dig into your family Bible as a source of information. Um, can the information be verified through another source, right? If there are birth dates listed, can you find that information in a birth announcement? Same for deaths and christenings and the like. Does the information match with information that you already know, right? Does it make sense within the given context? Do the entries look like they have been changed? That might be a sign that they've been tampered with. Somebody maybe had gone in and corrected an entry they didn't like. Could have corrected it for the better. We don't want to judge, but be aware of that. And then was the information entered by someone who actually had firsthand knowledge of the event? Has your family Bible remained in your family the whole time? Um, does it look like multiple hands have entered the information, especially if it sort of spans over many different generations, decades, and centuries? A healthy dose of skepticism um, is always good to make sure that your research is accurate. All right, if you do not have a family Bible or you don't know where your family Bible is, I have a few tips for getting started with trying to locate that material. First and most obvious, you know, talk to your relatives. I know it can be painful sometimes. Um, try to figure out, has, the, has these materials existed in your family tree at any point? And if so, where might the lines of inheritance be? Who, have, might it have been passed down to throughout the, the years. You might also consider consulting your local historical societies and archives. Um, think about where your family might have had strong institutional connections. The Ward family is a really good example. They were integral into the college's early years, so it makes sense that we would have a lot of their personal papers, their family Bible included. Um, consulting state organizations can be another tactic that you can try. For Maryland, the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Center for History and Culture, which was Maryland Historical Society, I believe. Um, they both have really good family Bible collections. So two good starting points for Maryland's uh, people. And then finally, of course, you can always try searching the internet. And of course, there are many, many things on the internet. So I've given you a couple of ways to kind of narrow your search in. Uh, eBay is a really good place to get started. They oftentimes have antiques or other family artifacts for sale. Um, the Internet Archive, and if you've never dealt around on the Internet Archive, it's an amazing, wonderful platform. Um, it's oftentimes used by archives in museums, especially smaller institutions, to house their digitized collections. So it can be a really good place to get in straight at that archival material. And then finally, Archives Grid, uh, which is a little bit like Google for archival material. Um, it has access to a lot of finding aids and other like uh, catalog information from archives. Um, so it can help you locate what institutions might have information related to your topic. A lot of things are on Archives Grid, not everything. So if you don't find it there, I'm sure you all know it's not the end of your search. You're just going to have to try a different tactic. Okay, so the last thing that I have for you guys are just some suggested resources. If you want to go a little bit further on any of the topics um, that we talked about tonight. The first are some suggested suppliers that you might go to if you want to buy any archival uh, grade materials for your own items. Um, these are two that I regularly purchase from for the College Archives, Gaylord Archival and Hollinger Metal Edge. And as far as I can tell, they do sell to private clients who don't have to be associated with an institution to purchase from them. Um, the one thing I will say is to be wary of commercial products that claim to be archival grade. That's not a standard. Um, if you want to buy anything that's paper-based, like these book boxes or some of those adjustable covers, the words that you want to look for are acid-free and lignin-free. Um, that means that they don't contain any acidic materials that are going to break down over time. If you're purchasing anything that you're going to use with photographs, you want to make sure that it passes what's known as the PAT test, which is the photographic activity test. That means that the materials that that stuff was constructed with, um, they're inert, they're not gonna it, it negatively interact with your photographic materials. I have a few suggestions for further reading. Um, good collection care guides from the Library of Congress and the American Institute for Conservation. That second one, I highly recommend if you have any archival family treasures that are like a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> they have really good guides for things like textiles, uh, wood materials, ceramics, things like that. 
Um, so disaster recovery things, uh, the link for FEMA that I mentioned, and ALA has a really good resource as well. Um, and then a link to the adjustable cover directions, uh, which I do have some paper copies up there. So if you want to know how to make those adjustable covers, you can definitely grab one on your way out. Genealogy resources. So I'm sure you all know a lot more about genealogy research than I do, um, but my one bit of advice would be to take advantage of as much free stuff as you possibly can. Um, so if you don't know, CCPL does have access to Ancestry Library Edition, yes. Um, so really, if you've not used that platform before, you can check that out through the library. Couple limitations, that's on-site use only. Um, and I don't believe you can upload family trees to the library edition. So that is kind of a limitation that way. Um, the other thing I will mention is that all Maryland residents can get an e-card to use Enoch Pratt library databases. And you can use a lot of these remotely. They have a lot of really great uh, family history resources, a lot of good digitized Maryland newspapers, access to Heritage Press, which you can access remotely, um, and a lot more. So definitely take advantage of that. And then last but not least, uh, my contact information, my email and office phone. So if you have questions, you want to know more about the college archives, we'd be happy to talk with you about that way. And then this down here is a QR code. Um, woo! That was good. <laughs> that was like <laughs> magic. <laughs> I did not anticipate that. Uh, if you want to use your smartphone, come up and pull out the camera app. Uh, and direct it at that little block down there. It'll take you to a link where you can download my slides in PDF form. I'll have it available for a month afterwards. Um, and that's all that I have. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'll be glad to take any questions if there are questions. I actually have a question. Yes. Heather. One one of the um, family Bibles that I have actually has hair. <gasps> No way, that's so cool. <laughs> cool, but also kind of creepy. Oh, totally creepy, yes. <laughs> but how would I, does it go in like a little mylar, you know, like, yeah, how would you That's interesting. About bi I don't get too many, like, I'll classify it as like natural history, even though it's not exactly um, biological materials that way. We'll put it that way. I don't get too much of that in the archives. Um, I would say mylar or just like an acid free envelope. I do an envelope for okay. something like that because it would be kind of hard to fold up a piece of paper and keep it securely in there. But yeah, like an um, you can buy those acid free envelopes to keep it in that way would be good. What happens when things that are family heirlooms already have scotch tape oh, in our belt no, and no, no, ready no. to fall apart? Yeah, yeah. Um, you're outside of my range of expertise a little bit. That might be a time to talk to a conservator, right? We can do a little bit more remedial work on the Bible itself. There might be safe ways to remove that tape, but without some like specialized training, I would but not the, encourage you to do the, it yourself. The front and back, top and bottom are bent. So that when you touch them, they're just going to disintegrate. Disintegrate, yeah, yeah. So this is actually where your whole digitization project coming in, like this week that you guys are doing, is really wonderful way to help with that. Um, because then you won't have to be handling materials quite so so much, but you can still get at the information in there. Yeah. And then the other things that I was blessed with about five or six years ago, my great aunt gave me three massive um, Bibles, mm. which are like, here's part one and part two and part three, and they were given to her by her grandmother when she was like eight or ten years old. That's really cool. But the spines are not great and... Yeah, yeah, so I mean it really depends on how much which money and like time and resources you want to spend on it. Some of the things I talked about tonight, these are all like things that you can do at home, right? They're right. relatively low, low cost. They're not going to fix any of the damage that's there, but they're going to arrest some of that damage from continuing. Um, I, you can definitely look at bookbinders, conservators to actually go in and fix some of that damage. Um, I, the thing with conservators, I've not worked with one personally, but you always want to get like samples of their work right, and like look at some of their references, see some of the work that they've done before so you know that they're legit, that they kind of have the credentials to back up um, what they're claiming they can do for you. Um. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned in the beginning that you have Bibles in the collection at the college. Mm -hmm. 
I often have researchers say, I know there's a family Bible. And I often see in probate records that the, the deceased person left the, the big German Bible to a family member. Yeah. Is there a way to, to connect what you have <laughs> with some of these kinds of questions. Sure thing, yeah. So one of the things I should caveat by saying we have some family Bibles, we don't have a ton. We have maybe a dozen or less, so mm -hmm. there's not a huge collection. Have there. they been scanned? They have not been scanned, no. Mm -hmm. And we're actually, one of the things I've been working on since I became archivist there is doing a whole recataloging project of all of our archival holdings. Because we had all of our records in like six different platforms. Um, and it's really, or we didn't have a record of it all. And I'm opening boxes and being like, oh, I didn't know we had this. That's cool. Um, so we're starting at that point, just to get the information about what we have. And we do have an online catalog for the college archives, which you can find through our library websites. Um, and there's like, I've got plenty of flips up here that'll direct you how to get to all of that. Um, we use Archive Space, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with. Um, essentially an online catalog built specifically for archives that houses a lot of that finding aid information, that would be the best place to start. And then of course, reaching out to me personally, because we don't have a lot of that stuff up and available. Um, I'm happy to do a little bit of research on my end. Yeah, some, you may know that it came from a certain family and it would be unfortunate to not you know, make that information available. Available, yeah, it is my long-term, I have been working on it <laughs> for years, Thank yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Bibles in general, family Bibles related to certain faiths or religions? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I the most commonly way that I've seen them is with Protestant faiths mostly. I don't know if anyone can speak to like the Catholic tradition that way. Um, yeah. The, uh, I purchased one of those from Carroll County, well, because I saw it in Carroll County Hospital, um, but from Amazon and it's that big, and it's the St. Joseph's Catholic Bible, and it has all the New Testament, it has the Rosary, the Stations of the Cross, and smack in the center are all kinds of pages, marriage, birth, death, mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. But that's the first one that I've ever known of in my life, you know, and I happen to be Catholic, so. Um, I have not seen any, but we don't have a ton of family Bibles in our collection. So it sounds like you can find them in a lot of different faith traditions, which is pretty cool. And I think I actually bought it on Amazon. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Who would guess, right? Yeah, go ahead. Put in a little plug. With the Historical Society, California Historical Society, they buy how is your materials in bulk. So they have boxes, they have these little foldy boxes, they have uh, acid-free envelopes, mm -hmm. and what they do is they break them down to the gift shop, and you can come and buy two or three, That's rather true. than having to buy 25. Mm -hmm. And yes. they pass the savings along to you, and especially the members, they get an extra 10%. That is so cool. I did not know that. I know as a Hollinger, especially, they usually have to buy bulk for at least three for their materials. Gaylord, you can usually get away with buying just one. Um, but that's really cool. I didn't know that those were all the that. materials and the white gloves if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Any other questions? Definitely come up and look at some of the stuff up here. Um, thank you so much. Yes, thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.